So greetings, friends. Uh, welcome to our first uh, event in our series of Digital Issues Awareness for Friends series. I'm so glad you could join us. Um, my name is Bill Waters, and uh, I've got a, a rich program prepared for today. So I'm going to jump right in by sharing the slides. Uh, appreciate if you, you mute yourself until you're ready to share something um, so that we don't have any background sounds. And let me go ahead and, and get the slides queued up so that we can share that. Okay, are you seeing the slides? Yes. Um, so I'm, the theme for today is mis and, mis and disinformation awareness for friends of the truth. And uh, I'm serving as the Lake Erie Yearly Meeting Digital Communications Facilitator. And so I took it upon myself to uh, prepare a series of events. Uh, so we'll, we'll have a couple more coming along. Um, it's a new series. I'm, I'm aiming for uh, monthly on Saturday afternoons. You're welcome to come to one session or all of them. They're not, they don't depend on each other. And uh, I'm hoping that it will raise awareness among friends uh, for some issues that I think are important, but maybe we don't talk about that often. And uh, I'm also going to be sharing educational materials developed by various digital human rights projects that I think are very smart and doing good work. Uh, today's uh, session is deeply uh, impacted by the tactical tech folks who do what they call info activism. Um, I want to do a quick check in. And what I've got here is uh, a jelly baby tree on the tree of knowledge. And I'm asking people if you'd be willing to share in just a few words, your name, your Quaker affiliation, that might be your meeting or uh, whatever affiliation you might have, and which jelly baby on the tree best represents your situation in relation to trust and understanding of the news. And uh, I'm gonna go down the list of videos that I have on my screen. So Bob, I think you're first up. <clears throat> If you can unmute yourself and just give us a quick check in. I'm Bob Ream, he, him, his, uh, North Columbus Friends Meeting, Lake Erie Yearly Meeting, which maybe I don't have to say in this context, but I will. I've never heard of jelly babies, and I'm not sure what to do with this picture here that I don't see well. So I'm seeing little pieces at a time, trying to figure out which jelly baby. Um, Maybe the one hanging from the branch near the bottom. <laughs> bottom right. Can you, oh, okay. can you say why? Um, I think I'm dependent on, on other ways of verification and so on. In this case, the jelly baby, which again, I've never heard of until today is dependent on that branch. And if the branch breaks, of course, the jelly baby will fall down. Thank you very much. Lynn, are you ready to share? Yeah, um, I'm Lynn Drickmer from Ann Arbor Friends Meeting. And um, I think I picture myself uh, the one hugging the trunk of the tree on the second branch. Oh, <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> I, I'm afraid I prefer print media and um, feel very unsure of very distrustful of online information, how how um, narrow its its focus, how, how narrow its its goal is, and how accurate it is. Thank you. Jeff. Yeah. Well, well. Um, let's see, uh, I don't know which jelly baby represents, uh, skepticism. Uh, I don't want to have this one on top. Yeah, well, I guess I, okay, I'll do that one. That's a good idea. That's right. The one on the top left. 
So you're feeling skeptical. How about you, Wink? Quite, quite. I'm Wink Coventry. I'm a member of Birmingham Friends Meeting. Um, I, I'm not a tree climber. <laughs> In a way, I would be the one lying on the ground. But um, I put trust into um, different news sources, print, like the New York Times and the Washington Post. And we live on the Canadian border. So we like listening to the Canadian Broadcasting Company, the National, every night at 10. And uh, National Public Radio and TV. I like um, the PBS Evening News. So I guess I'm kind of comfortable there. Thank you. Uh, it looks like Clemence would be next. I guess I'm a, a kind of a tree hugger, maybe. Uh, well, yeah, that one, well, yeah, because Bob was sitting on the branch, so. Uh, I'm Clemence Ravasson Rashan. I'm a member of Pittsburgh Monthly Meeting. I attend Erie Worship Group mostly in the summer when we're outside. And uh, I attend a lot of Canadian monthly meeting or we're meeting for worship in the winter um, to get a different perspective. Um, but my almost my entire news source is National Public Radio because I don't have a television and my local news subscription, uh, which I did renew in September has suddenly disappeared from my computer. So I was catching up on today because I only get one print version a week. Um, so that's where I am. Okay. I, I, I think I'm a, a tree hugger depending uh, on uh, that big tree is my national public radio stations. Stations. Thank you. I think Barbara would be next. <clears throat> Barbara Lissage, North Columbus Friends Meeting. Um, I'm pretty news avoidant, and uh, I would say the one laying down on the ground trying to just find very solid, basic facts. Um, I'm trying to disregard all the other stuff that is not very relevant. Thank you. Tom. Hi, I'm Tom Kangas, uh, North Columbus Friends. Um, I'm not a social, I'm not on social media, and so I'm not really sure where I stand overall, but I'm probably the jelly baby there that's down at the bottom that's getting a lift up because I'm, that, that's you, Bill, lifting, uh, <laughs> give me a boost up here. Very good, thank you. I think Nancy would be next if she's ready. <clears throat> Hi, um, I'm Nancy Fink from Oberlin Friends Meeting. And I um, don't do anything on social media, not Facebook, not Twitter, nothing like that. Uh, I'm forced to do email, <laughs> um, which I do, but I get, news from NPR and MSNBC and CNN. And um, I'm always, this question always worries me a little bit, but well, a question that worries me is, um, do you trust the news? Because it seems like there's so many different options and whether what you trust depends on what you choose to trust. Thank you. Inga. You're muted there, Inga. Thanks. Yeah, I'm Inga Briefker from Birmingham Friends Meeting, and uh, I um, I think I'm this jelly uh, baby that is sitting on that branch, feeling that secure. I'm not secure enough to be out here, but uh, I I do not engage in social media at all. 
Uh, I uh, regularly uh, receive the news on public uh, broadcasting, uh, Channel 56, also MSNBC, and read the New York Times pretty faithfully. Um, and I, I feel that, <laughs> that uh, we're getting a, a pretty fair uh, assessment of what's going on. Thank you. Eileen. I may be wrong. I may be wrong, but uh, I feel. Um, Eileen Hagopian from the Birmingham Friends Meeting in Michigan. Um, I don't know, I hate to say it, but I might be the one on the ground with a smile looking up and feeling hopeful and probably uh, too ignorant because I'm too trusting and too understanding or lack understanding, I should say. Thank you. And Sally. I'm Sally Weaver Summer from Broadmead Monthly Meeting. Um, I, um, I'm, I'm, I, uh, <laughs> I don't know which of these. I, I don't, um, for the last year or so, I haven't, you know, we used to listen to NPR all the time, but don't anymore, just don't have the, like the quiet. Um, and so uh, I read The Guardian, I get it daily and little thing. And that's my main news source right now. So let's see, where am I on here? Then, I, So I'm sort of uh, somebody who's, who's not real, not, uh, not real actively seeking, <laughs> which one would that be? Lots of sources. You could be uh, standing on the platform that you're used to. Okay, there you go. Thank you. All right, well, thank you, friends. Um, I think there's a there's a lot going on with the news environment that we're in, and so I appreciate your kind of contextualizing it a bit. Uh, in terms of our agenda for today, um, I want to talk about generally Quakers and the truth. I want to talk about understanding information disorder. Why is it so complicated? What are the different types? Um, I want to show some examples from social media of issues that of incorrect information. I want to talk about becoming an investigator, how you might do that and how other people are doing it, uh, what to do if misinformation is in your feed of what you get and what you consume. I want to, if there's time, show some examples of organized work different groups are doing to address this problem and maybe think together a little bit about what's a Quaker to do. Like what, what does it look like for Quakers in this, in this current world and share some key resources. I just wanted to point out here, this uh, tapestry square, publishers of the truth. Uh, uh, the uh, Quakers thought of themselves as being, uh, they, uh, my understanding is that in, in England at the time when Quakers were emerging, there was a, a change in the policy where it was, it became possible, there, was, there had been censorship of the media, of pamphlets and writing, and that was lifted. And so suddenly everybody in England was trying to get their word out. It was like social media <laughs> for pamphlets. And so the, the Quakers said that, that we need to be part of that environment and we're gonna think of ourselves as publishers of the truth. And so they got quite involved in the, the world of uh, publishing uh, pamphlets and tracts and that sort of thing. So uh, Quakers and the truth uh, from Quakerism, a little outreach from Philadelphia Yearly Meeting where they were describing Friends, and they mentioned some of the early uh, ways that Friends were referred to. Quaker is the name most often used to describe members of the Religious Society of Friends. The name Friends is frequently used as well. But at its beginning in the 1650s in England, under the leadership of George Fox, the early followers were called Seekers, Seekers of the Truth, Friends of Truth, or Children of the Light. Despite much persecution from the crown, Cromwell and other Puritans, many of these seekers spread the word of this religion. They got active. <clears throat> so <clears throat> if you think about uh, Quakers' connections to truth, early friends wanted a direct experience of divine reality, not secondhand notions professed by priests or professors. Um, can you think of other ways that Quakers have a relationship to truth? Anybody want to chime in here before I go through my list? 
What are some other ways that Quakers are attached to the truth? Speaking truth to power. Speaking truth to power, yes. Well, we, we tell the truth. I think we're committed to honesty. Yes. Would you call that the integrity principle? Yes. And, That's and sort not, of going, going the other way. Not swearing oaths uh, that you're going to tell the truth because the presumption is that you are telling it all the time. Correct. <laughs> this is wonderful. You're right on track with me here. Uh, speaking truth to power. And I think of friends as very fond of maintaining what they call good order when doing things. They have a certain attachment to that. Uh, so Quakers, uh, we, we like to think of ourselves, uh, if you remember, um, Friends developed a reputation for honesty in business because they would put prices on things so that people knew how much something was going to be charged, no matter whether they sent their child into the store or did it themselves, it would be the same, same price. Uh, and so they have a long connection to, to these issues of truth, uh, but they're living in a world that's quite different from when they first started. And the truth, it's, it's complicated, that's for sure. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, changes in news and information due to the internet. Um, one thing is just the sheer amount of available information. Uh, we have um, just so many sources, so many points of information coming at us. People mentioned uh, TV stations. They mentioned, it used to be what, four broadcast channels and now the cable universe plus all the streaming services. And then there's all the online um, and blogs and news and newspapers online, all of that. There's also the way we consume information. Uh, we tend to get it uh, uh, like quickly, sort of all the time, where it used to be maybe you got your Sunday paper and you would consume the, the news of the week or you get the evening news, which is a summary of what had happened in that news day. Now we get a kind of a constant stream of things coming through and there's sort of a, a race to be the first to share news agencies are trying to be quick to break stories uh, rather than waiting for the evening news or the next edition. And then there's this, the way that we're fed information. Uh, we, um, people who are on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter, on um, different applications, uh, different um, AP news wire, Reuters, uh, lots of different news services uh, customize what they share with you based on your interests and your past reading habits. And so we, we have this kind of, uh, not everybody's seeing the same thing. Um, I like to think of this as the algorithms of engagement. Uh, technology and machine learning are being used to customize what we see on the internet. Maybe you've heard of the term, the filter bubble. Uh, where um, we have a, a, we filter out stuff we don't want to hear and we get more of stuff that's based on things we like and people who we, we follow. So um, this story here, I wanted to point to you, uh, point out to you from MIT Technology Review. It's a recent story about how Facebook got addicted to spreading misinformation. Uh, the story is about the man who developed their artificial intelligence and machine learning tools. Uh, to figure out what people re reacted to, what they, what they were engaged with, and then creating a model for that and then running more stuff, showing them stuff that, that they would react to. Uh, and so uh, the, the subheadline is the company's AI algorithms gave it an insatiable habit for lies and hate speech. Now the man who built them can't fix the problem. So this is a, a quote from the article. This approach soon caused issues. The models that maximize engagement also favor controversy, misinformation, and extremism. Simply put, people just like outrageous stuff. Sometimes this inflames existing political tensions. The most devastating example to date is in the case of Myanmar, Myanmar, where viral fake news and hate speech about the Rohingya Muslim minority escalated the country's religious conflict into a full-blown genocide. Facebook admitted in 2018, after years of downplaying its role, that it had not done enough. 
and help prevent our platform from being used to foment division and incite offline violence. Um, so this whole uh, notion of uh, uh, the filter bubble and the algorithms that, that uh, narrow what we see is very active on Facebook, but it's also true. If you've ever gone on YouTube and you have autoplay on the next video, you watch something about a conspiracy theorist, you're gonna go deeper and deeper into related videos on that topic. So you find yourself getting a, a, a sort of a, a path toward more extreme or more, uh, um, a, a narrow band of information. <clears throat> a, quick, a quick quiz question for you. Can you guess how many things are searched in Google every day? <clears throat> Anybody want to take a guess at how many searches are taken daily? A trillion. <laughs> a trillion. <laughs> She's going big. It's big. 3.5 billion per day people are looking for information. And algorithms, Google's all about algorithms, right? They figure out what information is out there and they organize, they have to show you, you know, five or six things on the first page and they have to figure out what to show you. And so uh, it really, what you see is affected by your, your past behavior. Are we allowed to do a Google search to ask that question? You could try it. I, I was interested in this uh, recent uh, Pew research study. It was done in 2022 uh, in the spring. And they, they looked at global threats that people perceive to be global threats at 19 countries around the world. And uh, climate change is number one, but look at what's number two. The spread of false information online, 70% of people, the, the average is uh, around the country considered a major threat to their country's well-being. Um, you can see in this next image here, uh, the different countries had different strong feelings about it. Like if it's the, the green circle for a particular country, misinformation is that second column there, this column here. And so Canada uh, thinks that misinformation is their biggest, uh, biggest concern. Uh, where United States, where are we at for trying to see? US is at 70% of people believe misinformation. So it's below cyber attacks from other countries. But US people think climate change is their least big concern. There's a, there was other concerns that I'm not showing in this graphic, but so it's not a small thing now. Misinformation has become a big, a big thing. Um, if you think about, uh, there are different reasons. Uh, what we talked about the internet. We also think about society. Uh, the world has become a huge content generator where we have, um, people in news services all around the world and bloggers and tw tweeters and Facebook posters and Reddit posters and uh, discussion board posters generating content. And this comes from different perspectives, right? The information is, isn't always neutral. Uh, the information may be in support of a particular government, in support of a particular philo philosophical position. Um, so it's, uh, we have a lot of factors. There may also be uh, local concerns related to, I don't know, health issues or weather uh, or season of the year or holidays that affects what kind of information is being spread. Uh, and then we have, of course, humans. Uh, we are emotional creatures. Uh, we tend to be, um, uh, we, we get engaged with things that we, we have emotions, we have fear, we have awe, we have anger, we have embarrassment, we have frustration. All of those things affect kind of our behavior online. Our brains can only process so much information. So we tend to take shortcuts where we, uh, after we've seen something a few times, we think we know what it's about. Uh, we uh, tend to kind of summarize things, we, we scan things, uh, we, uh, we assume that most web pages are designed like other web pages that we've been on before. So we, we make some assumptions about things. And we have different motives and perspectives. Uh, it, being a woman is different than being a man. Being a, a, a person of color is different than not being a person of color. Uh, being a Muslim is different than being a, a Jewish person. So these different motives, different perspectives all affect this process. So what we end up with is we have the internet, we have societal issues, and we have humans, we get information disorder. 
uh, it's sort of a, a tangle and we're trying to make sense out of it. Um, so why uh, do you think the term fake news is misleading? Do people have any thoughts on why the term fake news might be problematic? Anybody? Well, it's just thrown out. It sort of indiscriminately. Uh, could you say more? Well, it. I mean, we've had examples of people who who call real news fake news because they don't like it. Um, and I think, are you gonna? say something about journalism as we go sure okay because so, i think i think that's an important uh an important area it's not like people are really checking yeah here's some of my thoughts uh, fake suggests that something is just true i have two somethings in there true or false but it's more complicated than that it's usually not just black and white Fake news is a term often used uh, in social media and by politicians as a way of discrediting information or journalists, which I think is the point you're making, Wink. Um, and there's a whole gray area in between what's true and what's false. So it's important to understand terminology. Uh, and there are different kinds of mis, dis, and malinformation, which is what I want to talk about next. But the term fake news is, is really become sort of not a useful term. I think it's being used in ways that are not helpful. So I want to talk about this. Um, the first draft project is a, a project for journalists to encourage them to uh, do, you know, understand the information uh, economy that we live in and, and the different kinds of issues that are affected uh, that have come up in this world. And so we have two circles, this Venn diagram. We have falseness on the left-hand side and we have intent to harm on the right-hand side. And so misinformation falls largely in the, it's false information. This disinformation is uh, information that is false and may also be intended to harm. Uh, it's, it's done for purposes. And then malinformation is largely shared in intending to try to hurt someone or something. So let's go a little deeper into that misinformation, unintentional mistakes such as inaccurate photo captions, dates, statistics, translation, or when satire is taken seriously can all be forms of misinformation that gets spread around. Whoever's coughing might want to mute. <clears throat> uh, disinformation, uh, fabricated or deliberately manipulated audio visual content, intentionally created conspiracy theories or rumors, uh, these are tend to be motivated by three factors to make money. So you know when people um, have websites that have a lot of traffic, they can charge more for the ads that they sell. So if lots of people are clicking through and seeing the ads on their page, they make money from that. To have political influence, either foreign or within their own country, or to cause trouble for the sake of it. You may have heard of the term trolls, people who are trolling or people who believe that chaos, uh, a chaotic environment gives them uh, room to, to, to act in ways that they couldn't do if it was a more orderly, orderly world. And then malinformation, deliberate publication of genuine information that is shared with intent to cause harm may include change of context, date, or time of content. Uh, one of the uh, ugly categories of this would be revenge porn, where somebody who's in a relationship with somebody else has an intimate picture of them. And after they break up, they share that information, those images with people outside of their relationship. Um, uh, an example that's pretty prominent in our lives is the, when the Russian agents hacked into the emails from the Democratic National Committee and the Hillary Clinton campaign and leaked details to damage reputations before the election, Hillary, the Clinton, Hillary Clinton's election against Trump. Malinformation released to try to hurt. Um, there's also sort of a process where uh, information goes from dark corners of the internet and kind of makes it its way into the nightly news or the mainstream media. Uh, so you might have a, an idea, a crazy concept about um, 
Invermectin or whatever the, uh, you know, a, a COVID solution or something that starts out with an anonymous website where somebody shares it without taking any credit for it. And then it might be shared within closed networks. Like there might be a, a private group on Facebook that shares information with each other. Um, and then uh, some, some of these things get picked up by conspiracy communities. If you remember how big QAnon was for a while, there was lots of stuff being shared amongst QAnon participants. And then it makes its way into social media like Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or TikTok. Uh, and then typically what happens is that the professional media says, well, there's this story circulating on Twitter about X, Y, Z. And they then kind of bring it out into the, the bright where, where everybody sees this, this story, which may be false, may be problematic, but now it's got a lot of steam. There's a lot of sharing going on. So it may start out small, but as people share it and as it moves through different spaces, it can become a, a big thing. So let's look at a few examples. Um, uh, first kind of category I'm looking at is real images that are framed falsely. So this one here to the left, it's a little hard to see, but there's a, a Muslim woman in a hijab who's on the phone. She's looking away from, there was a, there was a person who drove across a bridge and hit pedestrians on purpose uh, in, uh, and so this is the story about this uh, event which claimed that she was, look how indifferent she is. This person's been injured and she won't even look at them. But when she was interviewed, uh, she was traumatized by what she'd seen. And she was on the phone to somebody telling how bad it was and saying, I can't look at it. I wanna respect the people. I don't wanna look at them. So it was completely the opposite of what, you know, her not caring, she was caring a lot. But uh, a Russian bot network, which is a lot of fake accounts, kept sharing this story with the storyline of, of her uh, a Muslim's being um, indifferent to harming others. Uh, so an account associated with a Russian disinformation campaign implied that the Muslim woman depicted was indifferent to the victim of an attack. In reality, she was not looking out at the victim out of respect. Um, here's a picture. Uh, Jose Antonio Vargas shared on Twitter. This is what happens when a government believes people are illegal, kids in cages. And he's got this picture of a child in a cage. Um, but truth be told, the, this kid in the cage tweet received over 20,000 retweets. So it went out to 20,000 people shared it with their, with their followers, which means there's a lot of people seeing this. And a similar post on Facebook received over 10,000 shares. The picture was actually staged as part of a protest two days earlier at the Dallas City Hall against immigration policies. So this was you know, a protest. It was a creative protest set up um, and this was an example of a genuine image where the context got framed and warped. In this example, the author, Jose Vargas, didn't know it was a part of a protest when he shared it. He thought it was real. And so this was misinformation, but not disinformation. He wasn't doing it on purpose with the intent to deceive. Um, here's another example where Debbie Martin, Women's Scouts for Trump, uh, was posting about, if you remember, there was a, a migrant caravan scare where there was concern about uh, these groups of immigrants or migrants moving together in a caravan. And she says here, breaking news, notice it's all men, build that wall. Uh, and this photo was posted in the context of migrant caravan, but it's actually a photo of Syrian refugees in Greece in 2015. So the photo, it looks like a lot of men who are upset about something, but it's completely out of context. And then this image uh, shows Gre Greta Thorn Thunberg, uh, who's of course, you know, the young climate activist. And she was upset with uh, the Associated Press and other people on social media who were sharing this picture of her and commenting that it was a, a, a white movement, that it was sort of an elite white movement. And they said the original picture <laughs> had this other person, Vanessa Nakate, who was cropped out of the picture. Uh, so it was an accurate picture, but the way it was framed and presented, literally framed, uh, affected the story.
There's also uh, a problem when you get into disinformation where people are actively trying to produce content that looks real, but is fake. Uh, so you can see here, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, outside of their building, they have this stone wall and you can see that there's nothing above their, the name of their foundation. But somebody used an image editor and added Center for Global Human Population Reduction. If you remember, there were stories about something about the vaccine having a hidden impact on people or tracking devices or whatever. But this idea of global population reduction was, was put on there to make it, it looks authentic, but it's not. And then you've heard of deep fake videos. I didn't include the video, but this is a guy kissing his child and they're, they're having fun together. And somebody changed the image of the, of the child into Elon Musk's face. So he's, he's uh, this little baby looks like Elon Musk and it's in a video format. And the deep fake uh, world where you can take a, a video and add somebody else's face to it has become uh, relatively easy to do. Um, there are, for instance, there are apps now where you can put a woman's face onto a porn, a porn picture. You can change the face of a pornography picture to put a woman's face on it that's not the woman who was, was acting in that role. And that's a common thing that can be done easily. Bob, you have a hand up? You're muted. <clears throat> it's better if I talk if I'm not muted, I guess. Um, I'm a retired journalist, a lot of focus on LGBTQ in the church. And the big news story I was covering was the Ohio State University Newman Center, the Roman Catholic campus ministry, that prior to a, an edict from the bishop to fire all of the Paulist priests had been very friendly to LGBTQ people. And suddenly they became very different. And the story floating around Columbus was that the words all are welcome had been removed from the sign outside of the Newman Center. And I saw all these images of people had taken and I finally decided to physically go there myself and take a picture myself. But of course, I could have edited that picture myself to make it look like it was removed. I mean, it was just impossible to absolutely prove to the readers that in fact, that was what had happened. Yeah. Good example. Uh, in this picture of the, the deep fake video, there are things you can look for. For instance, in this video, which you can't see playing, but his nose is blurred because they, the image of the face that was laid on top of the video, when he would move his nose in close to the baby would get blurred because it was over, the, the fake face was covering the, the end of the nose. So there are techniques people can use to, to verify that videos were altered. But when you see it quickly and you're in a hurry, it's hard to tell the difference. Um, so the thing about um, misinformation is that it has real world impacts. We, we know this, right? Um, I just picked up a couple of examples. The BBC monitoring project noticed that uh, disinformation about the American, what's happening at the American border has led to many people trying to make the trip to come to the United States and get into the United States because they believe, you know, the uh, Biden administration has changed policies or certain countries can get through free easily uh, or uh, there's no danger crossing the border. Lots of stories get circulated within uh, networks that are unique to uh, these migrant groups where they might be using a WhatsApp uh, or they might be using a particular channel of information that's not mainstream news and they're learning stuff that is detrimental to their well health and well-being and to our country's efforts to manage this problem. Um, another uh, example here is that this was a study by GoodRx Health asking people about medical misinformation and their exposure to it. And they found that this was in March of 2022. Uh, over 70% of people have been exposed to medical or health-related misinformation. Uh, of those exposed, almost half are not confident in their ability to discriminate between true health information and misinformation. And social media is cited as the most common source of misinformation. Um, one example which uh, was sort of interesting from my point of view was that uh, during the early days of COVID, uh, a French health minister tweeted about that, that um, was it ibuprofen? That was one of the uh, common 
uh, painkillers, ibuprofen or one of the others, uh, would increase your, your negative symptoms. It was bad for your symptoms of COVID. And this turned out that this was not true at all, but it got spread quickly. Uh, and so people were not taking their, their uh, painkiller uh, because they had heard this story. Uh, and when the, the WHO, the Health World Health Organization, corrected this information, they couldn't catch up to the false information, which was sent out earlier. It's like the, the rumor goes out first and spreads widely, and then the answer, the correct information, can't catch up. So it's sort of a problem. And so uh, what about becoming an investigator? Uh, there are ways that this is being done. One of the first things to do is um, thinking about your feelings when you see a story. If you have a really strong, quick reaction to something, it, it may be a sign that you want to look for possible manipulation because um, uh, maybe you've heard of clickbait where things are written in a way where they want you to click on it. They want you to jump in and, and participate in, in sharing or, or viewing that media. Um, there are common misinformation techniques that are used uh, and, and are, are found sort of in the world of misinformation. Impersonation is a big one where you say something is from NASA. NASA says, you know, so-and-so is true. Uh, and so it, it appears to be credible because it, it has the logo or it has the, the, in, the, the it's, you're being told it's from a, a reputable source. So impersonation is, is a common tool. Emotional manipulation, you're using language that leverages strong emotional reactions such as fear and outrage. Uh, polarization, where you have uh, us versus them language, and it's it's used to sort of uh, drive. Can you believe this outrageous thing that the other side of this this debate is doing? Um, conspiratorial ideation, where explaining events from traditionally using alternative explanations that give weight to the idea that a small set of individuals, a secretive, malicious, elite groups, are controlling these events. Uh, we hear a lot about that in the Q, QAnon world. False dichotomies, where there's a logical fallacy that there are only two choices. It can either be this, they're going to either take away your, your stove. <laughs> this is the current thing that's happening now. Your gas stove could be taken away over your dead body. Uh, or, uh, but the idea that there's either it's either this or it's that, and it's usually not that. Or false balance. This is one that drives me a little crazy, where journalists are encouraged to, like, uh, have a um, on the one hand this, on the other hand that. So for years, the tobacco industry was able to get into discussions saying that some people say smoking is bad for you, but here's what we say. Even though the science really believed it was bad for you, uh, they would always try to show an opposite side, like the, the flat earther would get equal time with the person who's a geographer. So, so false balance. So let's look at a, a uh, let's use your detective hat now. We're looking at a post here. It was shared on WhatsApp, which is a communication, sort of a discussion tool that can be used. And on the left-hand side here, we have this, this thing was forwarded to you. Um, Bears return to deserted Walsh, Welsh village during lockdown. And this person's replying, absolutely amazing. I thought the goat story was good. This is incredible. I had no idea there were bears in the UK. X, X, X. And then when you, you can see the, the full text of the story here, and then you see this highly emotional uh, commentary about it. Um, but there's a few things if you start to look a little deeper. Uh, the message, it was forwarded, so it's not their original thing. Look at the date. April 1st, April Fool's Day. Uh, and the article content uh, it's got strong emotional language. When you dig down and actually read the story, not just the summary, but you get down into the story, the original story, uh, you, this is what it looked like, the original story. Uh, you can read here that she says she did not mind the bears, but that rumors that wolves had been heard howling at night were a cause for concern. I think bears have an attitude that if you don't bother them, they won't bother you, but I would like to be able to cross the street without worrying about a pack of feral wolves, she said. Now that it's April 1st in the new financial year, I would hope the emergency services would have the funds to do something about it. At least I didn't wake up with a woolly mammoth in my garden this morning as my sister in Cardiff did. 
So as you get deeper into this story, it's clearly a spoof. It's clearly an April Fool's Day joke, but it was shared, you know, as if it were real. So I guess that's a day when you really have to watch yourself, April Fool's Day. Um, so there are online tools that can help verify questionable content. Um, I wanna just share a couple of videos. Uh, the um, AFP, which is a, a French-based um, news agency, has become sort of a leader in debunking uh, false information in the news. They have, they have offices around the world uh, that do some work on this. So I wanted to share this video clip with you. Hopefully you'll be able to hear it fine about an example of a, a, a misinformation piece. In May 2022, three months after Russia invaded Ukraine, a viral post claimed that the city of Prague had put up a statue of a Ukrainian former leader. The post showed a photo of a Prague district mayor standing on a square holding a Ukrainian flag. Behind him stood a memorial to Stepan Bandera, who fought on the side of the Nazis in World War II. The post was shared hundreds of times, but online tools helped expose it as a photo montage. After Russia invaded Ukraine, many false posts began to appear, trying to discredit Ukrainians and EU politicians who expressed their support for them. This photo immediately made me suspicious because it reflected Russian propaganda, portraying all Ukrainians as Nazis or Nazi sympathizers. When Vladimir Putin announced the invasion of Ukraine, he said his goal was demilitarization and denazification. The implication of this post was that the Czech mayor admired or at least sympathized with the Nazis. First, I wanted to check whether this image or images similar to it had appeared online before. To do this, I conducted a reverse image search. I took a screenshot of the photo in the viral post and uploaded it to Google Images. Sometimes you will have to comb through pages and pages of links before you find a reliable source, but in this case, it was quite quick. Among the results was a Facebook post from February 22nd from the mayor's official Facebook profile. It showed him hoisting a Ukrainian flag to demonstrate solidarity. The mayor, Andrzej Kolar, has expressed support from Ukraine many times in the past. There is no Bandera memorial in this photo. The position of the flag, his face and body, as well as the vehicles in the background, clearly indicate it's the same photo as the one in the false post. I then carried out another reverse image search of the Bandera statue. To do this, I took a mini screenshot just of the statue in the picture. It turned out the memorial is in the western Ukrainian city of Lviv and the image was pasted onto the photo of the mayor. I then found the exact photo of the memorial used in the doctored image in a Wikipedia article about the Bandera Memorial in Lviv, Ukraine. Whoever created the viral image did not remove the flowers and wreaths at the base of the statue. Finally, to make absolutely certain no Bandera statue exists on this square, I checked the place myself. Since the square is busy with cars, trams, buses and the metro, it wasn't immediately obvious where the flag hoisting photo was taken. So I used geolocation to help refine my search. I noticed a KFC restaurant in the background of the photo. I found the restaurant on Google Maps and used Street View to zoom out in the approximate angle from which the photo was taken. I kept going until I found the plaza with the flagpoles. I went physically to the spot and took a photo. As you can see, there is no memorial to Stepan Bandera on this square. So this is a partnership with AFP News Agency and, and Google to do some uh, training of journalists. So like Bob, she went live to the spot to get, the, to get a photo, but using Street View and Google, you can do a lot <clears throat> just that way. I have another example <clears throat> of, an, of a, a story that was shared, and let's go ahead and just jump into that. 
In January 2022, as presidential campaigns gear up in Kenya, national media report a minor incident involving a Kenyan MP. Oscar Sudi, an ally of presidential candidate William Ruto, is briefly stopped at a Nairobi airport with British MP Michael Spencer. The two were quickly released. But the next day, an apparent front page story from 2019, making serious allegations about Spencer, begins spreading online. There's a lot of mudslinging during Kenyan election campaigns, so when I came across this post on Facebook and WhatsApp, I was immediately suspicious and I thought I should check it. The first thing I do is archive the posts. Sometimes by the time you finish checking it out, a post has already disappeared. An archive allows you to keep a permanent record of a web page as it appears at a given time. By submitting a URL, the site gives you a new link that will take you back to the archive. Then I did a keyword search, thinking about what I wanted to see in the results. Here, I wanted to see the front page of The Guardian. I also indicated the date of the front page I wanted to see, which was December 12th, 2019. In the results, I went to the image options and found some front pages of The Guardian newspaper. I spotted the one I was looking for, which matched in some aspects the one I was debunking. One difference I noticed is that in the original, the text is not blood, but the one in the post I was debunking was blood. Also, the headline that was used on the original text was different from the one that we were debunking. So those are some of the clues that made me realize that the post was in fact an altered front page of The Guardian. After determining this for myself, I went a step further and emailed The Guardian just to double check. They of course confirmed that the front page featuring Spencer did not come from them. So <clears throat> this is some good detective work by journalists trying to get the story straight. <clears throat> uh, are you familiar with reverse image search? Uh, with the, the world of artificial intelligence now, <clears throat> there's this a nice growing collection of tools that can be used to um, check what, kind of where an image was first published and, and uh, how it might have been used in different ways. Uh, and Tinai, which is the one I'm recommending as a good starter for people. Uh, and then there's Google Images, which we saw one of the reporters use, Bing Visual Search, and Yandex Image Search, which is a very big index, but it's run by a Russian tech company. So the, your, mileage, your mileage may vary as to how, wanna, whether you want to use that or not. Um, in terms of, I want to just kind of try a little activity here where if you're at a desktop com computer, um, what I wanna try to do is first of all, we'll talk about the activity and then we'll see if we could, we could try this together. This is a, a post by Mia. She says, the March to end COVID-19, well done everyone, amazing turnout. This is March 29th, 2020. And this image was shared widely on Twitter by people who claimed it was a March to end COVID-19 but it's actually from an event that happened before and was completely unrelated to the 2020 uh, pandemic. So my challenge to you is to uh, use these tools to find out uh, what event was this photo depicting and when was it first posted. So what I wanna try to do here is I'm gonna put a couple of things in the chat right now. <clears throat> Get that open. So in the chat, you should see a link to TinEye, which is the uh, reverse in, image search tool. And then I have a direct link to the, the image of the crowd. Uh, and so people who can, if you can download that, that image to your desktop and figure out if you can remember where you saved it to or copy the URL, either one of those will work. Um, maybe we don't need to go into breakout groups for, to try this. Uh, so what I want you to try to do is to, just a moment now, 
to go to, you save the image to your computer, go to tini.com and upload the photo and do a search. So you can either paste in that link to the image or you can download it and then upload it to TinEye. And then I'd like you to use the filtering tools uh, on the, the results page to see if you can figure out what this photo was actually about. Are people getting the, getting the project here? Good. <clears throat> how, how do you download the photo itself? Well, you would have to click on the link in chat or copy the link in chat. TinEye lets you oh. paste in a URL if it's a URL to an image, you can paste that image directly rather than downloading it and uploading it. Oh, oh up here. I'm not sure they go. Okay. But I'm interested if people can find out where this was taken and what it's about. <clears throat> we know, I'll tell you in advance, it's not a COVID march. The other thing you might see in TinEye is they have sponsored results near the top, which are things that a company is paid to put there. So you might want to ignore those. Well, maybe not. They might, it might give you information. Bill, I can't get in uh, to copy this uh, link. Uh, can you click on it? Yeah, no, no it's not active. On the screen. In your chat, you can't click on that link. Oh, in the chat. Is that what you said? Yeah. Yes, yes of course. Has anybody gotten into Tinai? Give me a, a nod if you're gotten in there. Okay. Okay. I see Wink has got a hand up. People are getting there. Host, host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay. Let's let's hear what people has anybody got a sense now about what what's going on with this? Uh, anybody been successful in getting some more information about this image? Let's see, Chad. I think Ohio people will be interested in this. I was able to get it in and drop it and have it come up. It says that April. 27th 2019 was is a date that's associated but i can't i haven't been able to get much further could you sort Please. by the the date like the latest or most the oldest image first and see if that gives you more information by sorting the results i got i went down the list of uh, possibilities and going back yeah. found out that it's fans of the cleveland cavaliers after they won a, a game, right? After a championship uh, win? Yeah, yeah, I see that now. Yeah. That's June 25th, 2016. So where was this taken then? I think in Cleveland. In, <laughs> it's in Cleveland. <laughs> so Yay! Almost some, my hometown. <laughs> got some good detective work here. But the thing about Tinai is it lets you go back in time to see when an image first appeared on the internet. And so then it could, might be reused for different purposes. Um, another technique is to look for the, the biggest image. It might be the highest quality, which just tends to be the first time it shows up. Okay, so, so let's-, Bill, let's do, you have, do you have to be using an, um, an image that is on an internet post? Uh, like well, any image that you make a copy of and then upload, it will try. It will try to, to okay. find it. We saw the, the author of one of those videos taking a picture of that statue and then right. just uploading it and seeing what she would find. Because it looks for things that look similar in shape to, to the yeah. image that you've uploaded. So let's let's try a second one. I'm going to go I ahead. See the words, I see the words Cuyahoga County on that building. Aha. Uh -huh. There you go. Uh, that's good. Here's another try. Um, this was posted by Madonna on Twitter in 2019. The fires are raging and the Amazonia continues to burn. This is a devastation to Brazil, to the indigenous people who live there and the plant and animal species that make this the most important biodiverse forest. So uh, what information can you see? Who shared it? Are they a reputable source? 
And how could you go about verifying it? Let me give you the, the link information for this one. I'm going to paste it into chat. Yeah, OK. <clears throat> this one might take a little more noodling to, to figure out. Was it in 2019 or not? When was it? Where was it? The implication of the, the sharing by Madonna is that this is happening right now in 2019 when she shared it in August of 2019. Yeah. The results. Anybody getting any clues as to where, if you look at the oldest one that appeared, like where it first appeared, it might give you some, some tips as to. So it, it can tell you where it first, when it first was found. Yeah. And then there are dates. So who published it or where was it published when it was first released? I can talk to you. 2020, 2012. I see 2009 or seven. I see 2008. Oh, there are more of them, yeah. Uh, do, do, any idea oh, the, what, what publication first shared this image? I see 1989, SEPA um, Press, Rex Features. Okay. I, I think this is like a National Geographic story on Brazilian forests mm -hmm. that, was, that happened years ago. If you sort by oldest, yeah, it comes, the top entry comes up from The Guardian. The Guardian, okay. You're getting good at this, Wayne. That was, <laughs> that was uh, April 23rd, 2008. 2008. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I appreciate your good detective work team. Uh, reverse image search is a new thing in our, our toolkit, a new way for us to, to explore. The third one down is thinkatheist.com. Yeah. <laughs> Group, green atheists. There right. you go. Okay, so we've already done this now. Yeah. All, All right. right, so. Let's talk about what to do if you find myths or disinformation in your own feed, in your own news world. What, 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 what do you think would be some options if you find stuff that you, it looks sketchy, it looks un, unclear. What are, your, what are some of your thoughts on this? What should you do or not do? I go to someone who's got more knowledge than I do and ask for help. Okay. Are you going to retweet it to your mother? <laughs> no, I'm not going to touch it till I get help. <laughs> Are you going to tell grandma not to take uh, aspirin because you <laughs> read it on the internet? Here's some tips from the Data Detox Team project. Uh, Realize your power to make waves. Realize that when you share, uh, you're spreading it and then other people sh share what you shared and it goes further along. So if something looks a little bit suspicious, uh, you realize that you have the power to, you can actually help debunk something or you can help spread misinformation. Another point is think twice before taking that personality test. Have you seen those where it says, what kind of Tolkien character are you? Or what kind of pizza are you? And they ask you for where you were born. And, and that information is used by profilers to begin to sh show you information. They want to know as much about you as possible to narrowly send ads to you that relate to you, who you are as a person. So the more of that sort of stuff you do, the more likely you're getting 
very narrow uh, casted information. Like it might be that they've decided you're a certain type of voter and they're only gonna show you certain types of ads for voting uh, because they think that you're somebody who is easily outraged by social injustice or something. Uh, don't take the bait, clickbait. Have you ever seen links where it says one thing and you click on it and you get something that's not really what it, what it was in the first place, it sort of goes, the, the link is really outrageous, the headline, and then when you get in there, it's not quite the same thing. Um, watch out for fakes. Um, seek the truth, which we did a little bit of on the internet. Uh, burst your filter bubble. Get some other sources of news besides the ones that you, you normally go to. And maybe debunk it, which is a, a technique of kind of telling what's true. Um, if you see somebody else, if your Uncle Bob has shared something that you know is not true. You, not you, Bob, the other Uncle Bob. Uh, you can say something like using empathetic language, like Quakers are good at using empathetic language. I've seen lots of people sharing this and I'm concerned that it's not true. Could be a starting, a starting gambit uh, to talk about this particular problem. Um, Bob, do you wanna say something? As a journalist, I've been trained to check everything with a second source. Oh. Somebody As asked me, somebody asked me the dates of the annual sessions for Lake Erie, and I looked in my Google calendar, but did not check another source to make sure I had the information accurately. I hope I do. Yeah. So get get a confirmation. I guess good journalists maybe have, you know, two or three. They they try to get make before they publish something, make sure it's accurate. Um there's a, a projects on debunking that have, have a few things to say about this process, which I'm not gonna go into great detail on, but the, the risk is that uh, the more you share a falsehood, it gets sticky in people's minds. The more they hear that something is true, even if it's in the context of debunking it, the more likely it is that they remember the false part and sort of gloss over the, the true part. So the debunkers say that you should share with a fact it's true that it's okay to take aspirin when you have COVID or whatever the fact is that's true. Um, and uh, then warn about the myth that there has been a myth being shared around and I'm gonna mention it once and I'm not gonna mention it a bunch of times. Explain how it misleads people and then reinforce the trueness at the end of the post. So the idea is truth, warning, warning, <laughs> fake stuff, and then truth to wrap it up uh, is sort of a, a, a good pattern for, for debunking. Um, so I wanted to share with you a few organized responses. There's a lot of, like, this has become a big problem. There are a lot of groups doing some great work on this. So I just wanted to share a few things on that regard. This is um, BBC. Uh, it's not CBC, Wink, but it's BBC. British Broadcasting, and they have a project called Media Action. And so this video shows some of the things that they're involved with at their, at their end of the spectrum. We live in the age of information. Humanity is more connected and interconnected than ever before. Soon, most people will have access to the internet via mobile phone with the whole world at their fingertips. But this is also the age of disinformation. It threatens human rights and democracy, acts as a catalyst for conflict, poses risks to our health. It leads people to lose faith in science, in democratic institutions and in the media. So how can people know what information they can trust? Someone called like these vaccines they are talking about. The vaccine, it's a... Uh sign of the beast or something. Initially, I was thinking the same line with the same guy. We targeted 133 uh, practicing journalists to be trained. These are people to create content for the generality of the populace. Before the BBC Media Action Training, I would say I had no real major information about this COVID, but after the training and all that, I feel like I have a duty to know what to say. The importance of correct information and access to correct information as understandable to the target audience cannot be overemphasized. 
The space for truth and for constructive dialogue is closing and we need to support those who are determined to hold it open. For the last eight years we managed to, uh, to figure out what to do with uh, Russian propaganda and uh, disinformation. But still, they use propaganda as much as they use weapons. They use disinformation before they want to track Ukraine. They make this pretext for the attack. It's something very new for Ukraine and it is pretty tough. You, you have to choose to publish things like that or, or not. What kind of a context you should give. This is a propaganda, but it could be used in the future for a real attack. In Ukraine, the independent press now plays a, a really great role informing people what is happening, what can happen next. We can prepare uh, ourselves and our audience for the next attacks and we can give voices to people who survived. They tell their stories openly and politicians, people who are in power, who can change something, they can see that and, and then they, they can make a right decision on how to end this war. So I think this is something that, that only uh, independent press uh, can give. Disinformation can be hard to recognize, but there are forces pushing back this tide by looking at why people believe disinformation and how and why they share it and how we can learn to counter it. We are applying our research and working with the University of Cambridge to inform approaches to tackle mis- and disinformation. We're working with local media outlets, improving audiences' digital and media literacy, and testing pre-banking materials that teach people about how information is manipulated and how to recognize it. We're using our expertise to evaluate what works and why, and help to build evidence of how to tackle disinformation here in North Africa and around the world. We need solutions to overcome these threats. We need to prioritize and invest in the disarming of disinformation. It is up to all of us to work together to reduce conflict, defend human rights and support democracies. So we see in this example, uh, the idea of debunking, pre-bunking, where you warn people that they may come across false information. You help them get ready, ready for it. We also see uh, the problem of propaganda and how, how that might play a role. Um, another example is people who are tracking uh, organized campaigns of disinformation, like uh, people who they they call them uh, bot networks, where you have a bunch of false Facebook accounts or a bunch of false Twitter accounts bunch of false TikTok accounts that, are, that were created to look like real people, but they are actually all being controlled by one organization or one group. Uh, and uh, so this, this project, the uh, Jigsaw project with Google uh, and other groups is trying to visualize and keep track of uh, misinformation campaigns. This is often related to, to uh, international issues like I, I popped up an example from the United States, Troll Tracker, Iran suspected information operation where uh, they talk about sock puppets. It looks like a real account, but it's somebody behind it. It's only a puppet account. Uh, and the topics were about, um, they were spreading misinformation in the United States to try to boost Iran's position in the world. And so this is a, a visualization of all around the world active campaigns that are being tracked and being noticed by researchers. Uh, there's also uh, games that are being developed to help people uh, learn about and inoculate themselves to, to misinformation. Uh, one here is called Breaking Harmony Square. This is a lovely town where everybody gets along. And then your job is to uh, create dissension within Harmony Square and sort of break it up into factions. And so as you play, you learn about the different techniques that are used in election misinformation playbook, targeting divisive issues, um, moving accounts into place, creating false accounts, amplifying, distorting the conversation, uh, making, the making it into the mainstream, 
etc. So this is a game. Another one is bad news. From fake news to chaos, how bad are you? Get as many followers as you can by outrageously sharing stuff are, are a couple of games here. There's also uh, short videos that are being developed that inoculate people on different topics. So you can see this, this link is called Inoculation Science. And they have a, a series of videos that are uh, produced that are short, you know, four minute or five minute videos that uh, help people understand different techniques that are being used. Um, there's also uh, work being done with journalists. The, the best example, I think, is the first draft news project, which I just took a screenshot of their uh, web page. They have essential guides book series for, for people who are working in journalism. They have testing your online sleuthing skills with verification challenges where you can try out different techniques like we did. You can try out your geolocation skills to figure out where something actually was photographed. Is it authentic or not? Tools and resources to help newsrooms and mobile friendly verification and monitoring tools are all things that are being you know, shared by them to help journalists in their work. And then there, here's my favorite group, uh, the Tactical Tech Initiative. I've been uh, following and participating in their work over the years on different issues related to um, how we, we can investigate the world around us and, and stick, to the, stick to what's true and also speak truth to power. And they, uh, they have a, a lot of different projects. Uh, the Glass Room online exhibit has got a lot of fun little mini games you can try. Um, and I give them a lot of credit for the, the structure of today's presentation. So my question to you is, um, this: look at this initial declaration of Quakers as being peace-loving people from way back in the, the day when they were publishing their truth about the peace testimony. Um, my question to you is, what should be, or what is the Quaker response to misinformation? Just what is good order? look like for us? Uh, I'm interested in any thoughts people might have in our last few minutes we have together. Uh, is this an issue for friends? Should we care about this? If so, what might we, we be doing? Bill, this is Wink. Um, I think uh, our ability to separate opinion from fact is has been um, compromised by a lot of what comes up. In fact, how can Fox even say it's news? So, and right. I know people say probably the same thing about MSNBC, except I tend to agree with them more, but I still think it's, it's uh, a lot of opinion. And what really struck me when Judy Woodruff recently retired from PBS Evening News, David Brooks was saying how wonderful she was. And he said, I can be giving my opinion and look at her and just has a stone face because she's a journalist. She's not going to agree with me or disagree with me on my opinions. And I thought that was really concise. and. Yeah. You know, you, you want to think about how journalists are doing their jobs. Well, one of the things that's a challenge for me is that I uh, have had a career working as a mediator. And so I'm trying to stay neutral. And so people would trust me as a go between. Uh, but in this issue, speaking, being neutral about something that's false is not a good solution. Speaking out ag against the falsehood, it seems like the better, the better approach. So the speak truth to power or speak truth to the misinformed <laughs> seems like a better direction. I kind of go back to what kind of jelly bear or whatever it was. Um, <laughs> jelly baby. Uh, and um, wondering what is the best way to get out of our own bubble without just getting into misinformation and disinformation. Yeah, because we are just as controlled by this as anyone else. 
That's a good point. I think I heard people saying that they have some trusted news sources that they believe have the veracity required uh, and that people are, are leaning on those, uh, which I think is a good start. But I think social media is such a big space right now. And there's so much happening that I think we have to be paying attention to the broader network. Any other thoughts about, um, I don't, do we have a Quaker misinformation office? I don't think <laughs> it's the elder bench, uh, but they're, they're not out of touch. The elders aren't plugged in. <laughs> Um, I put in the chat uh, the link to the slides for this, and I, I po I'm posting it on our interest group page, so that it'll be there in perpetuity. The slides are big; it's like three and a half megabytes, so it's a big download. But you can have it. Uh, other thoughts, Bill? Bill? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I I to point out that uh, <clears throat> you know everybody has on their phone a um, service, um, whatever the name is, Siri or so forth, uh, that instantly, essentially instantly provides answers to questions. And uh, I think it would be extremely interesting to test their power to distinguish truth from falsehood, you know. Uh, yeah, because, so we're because using that as a, a source. <clears throat> It, they do it so instantaneously, you know, that I'm thinking, wow, uh, let's see if they can, they have the ability to distinguish truth from falsehood. Yeah, I, I think that there are some agendas that even Amazon and Apple have, uh, and they may not have access to information done by investigative journalists and that sort of thing. You know, they may yeah. go to, to more like Wikipedia or which is an interesting space. Um, well, the slide I'm showing now are some resources that I think are really valuable. How about that image, the first publishers of truth? This is from an early manuscript in England uh, uh, where this is the front page illustration of uh, talking about the history of friends in their early days of pamphleting. But I wanna just mention a few of these resources. The Data Detox Project, this link right here. Uh, they have a, a quick tips for um, recognizing uh, information. Let me just put that into the chat also. This is a nice one. It's, a, it's like a two pager that they had, they made into a little booklet. It, it, it actually is a little out of order when you print, you print it out because it was designed to be printed and then made into a booklet. But it's uh, some tips from the data detox folks on how to deal with this. Um, the first draft project for journalists is here the pre-bunking project of Google Jigsaw. And then there's a whole journal, the Harvard Kennedy School Misinformation Review is people who are becoming researchers of misinformation, how it spreads, where it's a problem, examples of it going badly, being used by bad actors, very authoritative information from researchers there. There's the BBC Media Action Information Disorder Project. Uh, they have a guide tackling the information disorder. And then there's the AFP fact check site that I, we saw a couple of videos from are all quite valuable uh, resources. So we've come to the end of our time together. And uh, I just wanna say uh, thank you for giving me an audience and for participating today, for going out there and investigating a bit. Um, I uh, am, am Looking forward to the series continuing next month, where we're going to look at a different problem on the internet, which is called uh, deceptive design or dark patterns, where things are portrayed in a way where they try to get you to subscribe to something you didn't really want to subscribe to or add an extra item to your, your cart when you're shopping. The sort of the way design is being used against us. And so I want to talk about that a little bit in our next session. So I, I'd welcome you back if you're if you're available and interested. I need to go ahead and Clemence. Uh, I just